All right. So last week we uh, were teaching about, um, uh, you remember Jesus, we're in chapter eight and Jesus says, uh, who do people say I am? Remember that conversation? And uh, and then at some point after they give a few answers, he says to Peter, he says, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. It's a great, great confession from Peter that you are the Christ. And then later, uh, Jesus starts talking about uh, all the things that must happen to him. So he's revealing to them all the things he, he's going to suffer, including his death and crucifixion and everything else. And what happens? So the guy who just declared Jesus as the Christ, what did he do? He says, uh-uh, no, that's not happening on my watch, no. And Jesus rebukes him by saying, get behind me, Satan. Alvin. You know, it's almost like, like uh, Peter said, I have just said that you are the Christ and that, that can't happen. It can't happen. It can't happen. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, these teachings, as they unfold, we're going to go through some of this today. They're, they're hard for them to understand. He's slowly revealing himself to them through the, the chapters of Mark. And when he starts getting into the difficult stuff, the things that must happen, that's hard for them to accept. Why is that? What was their view of the Messiah? Part of the culture. They used to teach Isaiah 53, not as a suffering savior, but as Israel. The people of Israel. Israel. Yeah. yeah. So they were conditioned to wait for a Messiah who was a conquering Messiah. Yeah. Uh, and when Jesus came, they didn't understand that. Yeah. And so as we move forward, we're going to be in uh, uh, Mark 8, 34 and 35. Um, it gets increasingly more difficult for them to hear some of the things that he's going to be teaching them. So uh, let's start there. Jack, uh, let's read uh, verses 34 and 35. And he summoned the crowd together with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Now, it's bad enough that the disciples hear that Jesus is going to suffer. Okay, now what do they just hear? They're going to suffer too. That's what he's telling them. You know, now Jesus told them they have to do the same thing. Everybody knew what Jesus meant when he said this about the cross. What what is the cross? What did that symbolize? Yeah. There's no there's no misunderstanding what he meant here. It's death. Yeah, everybody knew what he meant. Uh, they knew the cross was just an instrument of death. And the cross had no other purpose. There's no swooning. <laughs> no, no swooning, yeah. That, that's a whole nother lesson. Uh, the cross was not about religious ceremonies. It's not about traditions or spiritual feelings. The cross was a way to execute people. Pure and simple. That's it. And in these 20 centuries uh, after Jesus, uh, we've sanitized it and ritualized it uh, quite a bit. Um We've made, we've made the cross jewelry. We've made the cross uh, marketing statements. We've made uh, the cross uh, a fashion statement. We've made it a commentary. But I think we've lost, a lot of people have lost what the meaning of the cross really is. So when Jesus is saying, take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me, a lot of people don't want to do that. I think the disciples know full well what uh, what he's saying to them. You know, would it have been better if uh, if Jesus would have just said, hey, walk down death row daily and follow me? How, how would that have gone? What, what if that was the message today? Walk down death row with me. It wouldn't go over very well, would it? But that's exactly what he's saying to them. And Jesus makes deny yourself equal to take up the cross. The two express the same idea. The cross wasn't about self-promotion or self-affirmation. Uh, the person carrying the cross couldn't save themselves. And that's kind of the grand paradox of all this. We're preoccupied with saving ourselves. And the very attempt to save ourselves will result in our destruction. You can't save yourself. And yet we do try, don't we? We do try. Well, I'll start going to church when I you know, kick this habit. I'll start going to church when I'm a little better person. I don't want God to see me this way. 
I got news for you. He sees you that way. Now, well, you know, sometimes I find that when we are dealing with Jesus Christ and it's it because he's spiritual and because he was physical and all this, it's hard for us to grasp things. But I remember in the band of brothers, there was one man that seemed to be untouched by the by the horrors and also by the threat that they were going through. And they finally asked him, well, what, what's, why did you, why can you do this? He said, I already know I'm a dead man. Yeah, there, there's something to be said for that. And because he already knew he was a dead man, then the threat of death was no longer rattling his brain. That's right. That's right. But so it had to be a little unnerving for the disciples, don't you think? I mean, think about the, the lessons that he's given him in just the last uh, last two lessons we've done here, you know, their fear is already very high. And now you're telling them, you got to take up your cross and follow me. That probably didn't sit real well. And it's a normal procedure for the condemned person to carry the cross beam to the, the uh, execution. And you know, Jesus had to carry the cross himself. Usually he just carried the cross beam, but that, that cross beam by itself, everybody knew what that meant. You know, he's saying, if you want to follow me, don't expect an easy time. That's what he's saying. And I think a lot of people, I think that's why sometimes you get the seed that doesn't take root. Because I think people think once they become a Christian and the seed takes a little root, I'm on easy street. I'm good to go. If God is for me, who can be against me? Right? And I think that's why people fall away a lot of times. You know, your, your hopes and wants and expectations, you're expecting those to be to be met. And that's not the way it works. Have you ever pondered what that means in your life? I think the disciples are pondering that right now. You know, as we go further and further, Jesus is revealing more and more about what's going to happen to him and to them, and they don't like what they're hearing. Now, I can't say that I really blame them, you know, if you want to be a Christian, you have to be willing to pick up that cross beam and follow me. You know, in other places, Jesus says, you know, count the cost. If you want to follow me, it's going to cost you your life. You, th you think they're, you're being counseled when you, you go to an altar call? You think you're being counseled that way? We're not. And you're not really ready to hear that. You do need to have the, the seed take root. Let's move forward. Oops. It'd be nice if I followed my own prompts on my notes here. Jack, let's go ahead and read verses 36, 37. For what does it benefit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what could a person give in exchange for his soul? You ever thought about that? <laughs> What's the worth of your soul? Have you thought about that? It's priceless. Jesus was willing to die for your soul. The soul has infinite value. And there's lots of stories, lots of literature about people that are selling their soul to the devil for thing, for temporary gain. You think, I, I remember when I was younger, there's a movie called Crossroads. Lousy movie, but they had the point about Ralph Macchio. He's a guitar player. And some, some old guy uh, had sold his soul to the devil, you know, to be talented. And now years later, he wants to meet at the crossroads again and get his soul back. Well, Makes for a good movie. I don't know that the devil is quite the negotiating type when it comes to giving those back, though. <clears throat> God gave his life for your soul. It doesn't get any higher value than that. And amazingly, you know, people live this way before uh, Jesus are the ones who really are genuinely happy. If you really have that view about life and death, that you've taken up your cross, you're denying yourself, those are the happiest people. I mean, the people that I know that are Christians are the most joyful. Uh, Len had Ali in here a month or two ago, where, how long it's been before I started teaching. Do you ever see a more joyful Christian? And when you hear his story, he was given a vision of Jesus. Then he goes and declares it in a mosque. Okay. Then he gets beaten to a pulp, left for dead, gets miraculously healed, has a child taken from him, 
His, he hasn't seen his wife in how many years? Seven years. And yet he was here. He was the most joyful Christian I've seen in a long time. John, he's in, they were in India. Now they're in Africa. And they're casting out demons. And they're praying over people. And people are getting saved. It, it, it's just awesome to see what he's doing. But he's yeah. denied himself. He's, he's denied, denied himself. himself. That's right. What does it mean to pick up your cross? Probably. Yeah. I mean, think about his story. You think he's picked up his cross? You think he's denied himself? And yet, like I, Len and I have had this conversation, he's one of the most joyful Christians I've ever seen. It's really amazing. It, it seems uh, counterintuitive, doesn't it? I mean, it goes against everything that we we think in our, our fleshly life, you know, but is there anything more joyful than knowing that you're secure and going to heaven? You know, John, it was the same thing when Rob brought that fella in here from India mm -hmm. and we sat with him for about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. He was as joyful as could be. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. His Ali's testimony, I'll never forget that. That, that was phenomenal. I wish we could have posted it online, but I mean, for safety reasons security you know, we can't do that but it was phenomenal um testimony you know in james it says consider or count some of your translations may say count consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters whenever you face trials of many kinds i'm having a hard time with that verse this week okay and i want you to know i wrote most of this lesson before we get the results on friday you know I can tell you firsthand that it, it's sometimes hard to consider these things pure joy. But maybe God's got something else in mind. You know, first of all, the, the word count or consider, uh, it's a financial term. It means to evaluate. Okay. When James says count it as all joy, he's encouraging readers to evaluate the way they look at trials. What's the worst that can happen at a trial? Die. You can die. You die, you go to heaven. Mm -hmm. I listened to a testimony from Joey Erickson Todd yesterday, mm -hmm. and she was teaching on joy. Yeah. And she has spent 48 years in a wheelchair. And she talked about most of the time that it's not about being delivered from your trials, but it's knowing the delivery. Having such a personal relationship mm -hmm. with Jesus Christ. If you're talking to him, she exhibited such joy. It's made me think that I ever complained about anything. Please just smack me. Yeah, and it's, yeah. Uh, and, and just so you know, God has smacked me around a lot here lately. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is true. When we had that tornado, a small tornado, you know, hit our house and caused some damage and stuff when we're still going through some of that. But when I saw some of those tornadoes that got hit, in Oklahoma and Nebraska and Iowa, like, I don't have anything to complain about, you know? It could All right, have been so worse. I, could have been worse. <laughs> exactly. Could have, could have been worse. Well, <laughs> I showed you some of the pictures of the house rotting from the inside out, but uh, yeah. You know, he calls believers to develop a different attitude when it comes to trials. Look at it from God's perspective. You know, we should be prepared and not caught off guard when a sudden trial comes upon us. And I can tell you that Patsy knew on Monday, we didn't get the call till Friday. She knew Monday that she had that she had cancer. Yeah. When we're in the middle of trials and tribulations, the thing that keeps me grounded is Romans 8, 28. All things work for the good of those who love the Lord and according to, mm -hmm. according to his purpose. And we need in fact, make sure that we're in his purpose. Yeah, absolutely. There was somebody else in there enough? I was just going to say, I think it, if we come to the place where we can consider it joy and live out that joy, it's a total unknown to the world. That's that's a game changer. Yeah, that's, that's a game changer if you get to that point. You know, Jesus said in, in John, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. Okay, so there's no guarantees that because you're a Christian, and you're walking to the Lord, that things are going to be easy. Alvin, you ever, you've been a, a lifelong Christian. You ever had any troubles in your life? Yeah, it's just that's there's no, in fact, that's the guarantee you're gonna have them. Yeah, you know, and typically a, a trial is not an occasion for joy, and and I don't think James is suggesting that we you know look at it that way. Trials are difficult and they could be painful, 
but they exist for a purpose. Trials have the potential of producing something good in us. Um, and for that reason, for this reason, they're an opportunity of expressing joy. Lynn. John, doesn't, doesn't Paul actually talk about that in Romans when he said, we glory in our tribulations? Yes. Knowing tribulation produces mm -hmm. perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint. That's right. You're, you need to look at the big picture. I think that's what Paul's getting at. If you look at the big picture, we consider trials as things to rejoice in. You know, um, James urges us to work on changing our attitude from dread to positive expectation. Faith, trust, even joy. You know, um, and you've heard me talk about this before, but I've got several members of my family that aren't saved. I have a daughter that is off in the far country, a prodigal daughter. And this is an opportunity for us to show how a Christian gets through a trial. So if you're praying for us this week, I want you to pray for that as well, that we will be able to be a example of, of joy during a time of trial. Because people who are lost and don't have that concept, it'll, it'll look strange to them. It'll look strange. How are you doing this? Well, I'm doing it through the strength of the Lord. That's how we're doing it. And I'm going to tell you, uh, Friday when we got that call, I think it took us all of two or three hours to get to that point. You know, because you're a little bit of shock. You know, I mean, you're processing stuff. We had grandkids over that were in the middle of making breakfast for and everything else when you get the call. But two or three hours, we're like, okay, what's the worst that can happen? You die and go to heaven. That's the worst. Oh, okay. Well, we're Christians and we're not worried about that. So this is an opportunity for us to show unsaved family members uh, how you go through a trial properly. Then uh, Jack, let's go ahead and read uh, Hebrews 12 too. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What, what does that mean? For the joy set before him. Terry. The joy that he would have of knowing that now we are all able to be with him eternally. He's got a different perspective. Now, does that mean that it wasn't still a trial for him? I mean, when he was in the garden praying, what did he do? He asked God, if you, if you can take this cup from me, but not my will, your will be done. Len. But what is the joy that was set before Jesus? The cross. The he cross is the joy. God. I think it was us. That us? That us the joy? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Had, the soul? Yeah. Because he endured the cross for us. And, and so we are his joy. Think, think about that. Mm -hmm. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And more, more, we think of it in terms of our own children, but I think Christ thought much of it in terms of us. Yeah. Sorry. I just keep going back to that parable Jesus told about the man who goes into a far country to obtain a kingdom. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus was on that cross, that's what it took for him to win the souls of all those who would be his kingdom. When he came off the cross, he then had his kingdom. The kingdom of God is here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't that great? Um, this week, one of the things that's been recurring to me over and over again <laughs> is the fact that when God created the earth, and we say heaven and earth and, and all these other things, and the last thing mm -hmm. was he created man in his own image. We know from what he prophesies that the only part of that creation that he's going to keep for himself and put in a new heaven and new earth is man. All the rest of it's going to be burned up. I, can we comp, can can we even understand how important man is to God until we see the cross? I don't. I don't think we can. I, I don't think you really can. I don't think. Have you ever stopped to ponder what Alvin just said? 
how valuable we are in God's eyes. The fact that Jesus went to the cross to save our souls. And you stop and think about it, it's, it's hard to fathom. The more I stop and think about those things, the, the more confused I get. Like, uh, how, why? I've seen your people. Okay. You know, a lot of them aren't, aren't worth saving, <laughs> myself included. Jack. I think God is totally incomprehensible. The whole concept that he knows every person on this earth. But here's he every it, prayer. But he, he gave us Jesus Christ to make it where every human being can find God. And it's an incredible plan. And it's hard to conceive, but that's that's the plan. Jesus Christ came down here and made it possible for us to have eternal life and be the only thing in creation to have eternal life. And that Jesus, his, he calls him his son, but he's not really his son in our thinking. Right. He calls him his son, so we'll understand. It's also we'll comprehend and have something to accept to give us the possibility of that eternal life. It's incredible. It is incredible. We can't great. even comprehend the guy that's putting it together. That's right. Yeah, you, you can read the Bible all you want. And the more I read it, the, the less I the more I realize how little I understand. It's incomprehensible. We we we've talked about it before and in Alvin and Lambert, we've talked about it many times. The more you read the Bible, the more you understand some things, but then you realize I don't understand as much as I thought I did. Yeah, it's it's a conundrum. Understand is how much of a sinner I am. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's pretty clear. I, I didn't need the Bible for that. I, I knew that, and uh, other people reminded me of that. So I knew that. <laughs> Thanks, Lens. Yeah. <laughs> From my, my perfect daughter over there. Uh, it says, it's, yeah. Yeah, she, she got the, uh, the, she's the counterpoint to my sense of humor. Uh, so uh, it says on there, it says, fixing their eyes on Jesus. In the Greek, that word means to turn away from everything else. So when it says fix your eyes on Jesus, it means look at nothing else but Jesus. That's an incredible description. Now, you all know I, I love Charles Spurgeon. In, um, in fact, so much so that Len brought me cigars today. Um, here's a quote from Skir Sturgeon, or Spurgeon, Sturgeon, that's a fish. Uh, Spurgeon, uh, Jack, you want to read that? Before I tongue tie anymore. We must guard against seeing Jesus as only an example. He was and is so much more. But he also remains the ultimate example of Christian endurance. Looking unto Jesus means life, light, guidance, encouragement, joy. Never cease to look on him who ever looks on you. Isn't that great? Spurgeon was, was, was incredible. I love him. You know, when you see a Christian that isn't exuding joy, what goes through your mind? What's wrong? What's, what's wrong? <laughs> That's a good one. Okay. I think that's a, I think that's a, a, an important point right there. What else? What do you think though when you see a Christian that isn't joyful? They're in sin and don't want to confess it. That that could be Terry. They're going through a tough time and have not set it in perspective. Yeah, we, we tend to uh, internalize when we're going through a tough time sometimes. And sometimes, I have to admit it, sometimes praying about something isn't automatically my first response. My first response is, how do I get out of this? You know, one of the, I remember Bart teaching us, I don't know how many years ago, that is the reason we don't see more miracles is because we're so self-reliant we take our own means and capabilities to get out of these situations. We don't even allow God the time to do something miraculous in our lives. I, I think there's, there's great wisdom and truth in that. And joy is one of the vital gauges on the dashboard of Christian life. Ellen. I think sometimes without realizing it, we've already written the story we expect to live out. And when these things come up, it's suddenly kind of irritating that uh, maybe this the story I've already written out is my story, but not his story. Yeah, yeah exactly. John, I think sometimes the lack of joy in people, you, you know, all of those reasons that people mention are, are accurate, but 
there are people who read God's word, who pray on a regular basis, but because of attacks of the enemy, they're not terribly joyful sometimes. And, and, I, and, and I think it's really important to pray against that on a regular basis. And that's what the fellowship of other believers is about. Amen. Uh, because if you don't have the fellowship of other believers, you're left to yourself to fight that. You weren't meant to do this life by yourself. I mean, there's a reason why the Bible refers to this as the body of Christ. Okay. You're, you're, think about the situations you've been in. I mean, even just recently, you know, for me, I like the, the phone calls and text messages and, and everything else are, are phenomenal. I, I love that. It's so reassuring. It, it really helps my faith when you're going through that. And I go back to the example that Ali presented. I, I can't imagine there is no trouble I've ever had in my life that comes close to anything he's going through. Nothing. And he's the most joyful person I've ever seen. Done. I have a tendency to confuse happiness with joy. To me, oh, I, I think people, in general, I think it's a, it's a big problem. problem. Happiness is situational and joy is eternal. Joy comes from God. I need to be in joy with God as opposed to happiness with what's situation. Yeah, to have that kind of joy requires the Holy Spirit. It really does. You can't even begin to comprehend these things without the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have it, then you're, you're stuck with happiness. What happens to you? Yeah, I, I think I've told this story before. I remember having a conversation with one of my brother's wives. And she said, her and the kids were talking one time. You remember that week when dad was so happy when he got that new car? He was happy for a week. He doesn't know the Lord. He's one of the ones that we're, we're working on. Doesn't know the Lord. So he has, he has no idea what joy even means. And, uh, Jesus goes on in, in the teaching. Jack, let's go ahead and read this. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You know, one commentator said, If Jesus Christ had come into the world as a mighty and opulent man, clothed in earthly glories and honors, he would have had a multitude of partisans, and most of them would have been hypocrites. That's, that's true, isn't it? It's kind of funny, but it's true. Most people think following Jesus is conforming to some sort of establishment, and it's, it's not. It's a rebellion against your fleshly life. You know, we're called to rebel. Rebel against the tyranny of the flesh. Rebel against the fear and conformity of the world. Against the traditions of men. You know, why do you think Jesus was calling out the Pharisees in his last couple of lessons? You put the traditions of men ahead of the commands of God. And in doing so, you, you kind of diminish the commands of God. You know, if we're honest, um, we have a deep desire not to be embarrassed. Would you say that's true? You know, not to be ashamed. We often hide our devotion to Christ from the world because we don't want to be embarrassed. You know, there's, Mike and I were talking about this uh, earlier there there's a freedom that comes with getting older now i know i'm preaching to the choir here okay <laughs> but there's something about being older in age and not caring about what people think anymore you know what i'm saying you know, mike says well yeah you demonstrate that all the time um and uh but it's true you, there is a freedom that you have, not only a maturity in your faith, but there's a freedom in being older that says, I really don't care what you're into. This is who I am. You know, have you ever been in that situation? Sure. <laughs> I'm gonna take it that Bobby has. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, we worry about uh, a loved one or the child that's in the far country, wonder if, if they're going to still love you, if you can still love them when they're in their sin, you know, and then, you know, what is, what role does grace play in all this? You know, it, it can be tough. You know, despite all the dangers of Christian life, despite the hate the world directs at Christ and his followers, I will not depart from him. Do you know anyone that doesn't know that you're a Christian? I'll take that silence as a no. That's good. 
people should know who you are in Christ. It should be, and, and you don't even have to speak it. Hopefully the way you're living your life is, is enough for people. Cheryl. Yeah. Your actions speak louder than the words. Yeah, exactly. You know, we've been trapped in this worldly life and, you know, I've tried it that way. I tried the worldly life, you know, took a pretty good shot at it. I made a nice living. There's a lot of things I could do on my own. And I got to tell you, it's not, it's not fulfilling in the least. You know, I told you the story that, you know, I wanted a Lexus so bad. Well, I, I saw the owner of the company drive one. I got it. Well, there's a difference. He was a multimillionaire. I wasn't. I finally got one. Finally got the Lexus. Pat, how long did I drive that thing? A couple of days, maybe a week. I drove it and I was, I was almost embarrassed driving it to work. I gave it to Patsy. I went back to driving the Nissan. Yeah, you try. It just, it's not fulfilling. I understood exactly what my brother's wife was saying. That he was happy for a week when he had his new car. I don't think I made it a week. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Are you laughing back there, Marv? Or was that a cough? Okay. Yeah. No, that's true. I, mean, I think it has a lot, of, a lot to do with looking inward. If you're constantly looking inward, you're fearful, you're anxious, you're depressed, you're sad. If you look in, when you look outward toward others, those things go away. I think that's one of the problems we have in you know, this generation of kids. I think they're looking inward all the time. <clears throat> and I think as parents, they've you've fueled that in many ways. And there is no joy in just looking after your own happiness all the time. There is none. Let's move on. We're going to be in chapter nine here. We're talking about the transfiguration. Uh, Jack, let's go ahead and read that. And six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And you can see that uh, Mark is having a little bit of a tough time describing what he's, what has been seen. Which obviously, who saw this? Peter. Peter's probably is relating this to Mark. Okay, and he's having a hard time describing it. Remember, you know, Paul, the Apostle Paul had trouble describing what he saw when he's given those visions. He just, he couldn't even describe it. This is Paul. Think about it, how wonderful a writer he is. And he couldn't even come up with descriptions. Remember that, that little girl, Akiana? She's in her 20s now, the artist. And God gave her visions and, and gave her the gift to paint and everything else. And she was, she got to see heaven in one of these visions. She goes, there are colors in heaven we don't even have here. I can't even describe them. Can you imagine that? There's colors in heaven that we don't, we've never seen. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. But what happened six days earlier? Someone want to give them a hand with the door back there? What happened six days earlier? That, that passage starts off with, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. What, what happened six days prior? Six days prior, they're in Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, and that's where Peter confesses him, you are the Christ, and then moments later, get behind me, Satan. That's what happened six days earlier. Now, Jesus is taking him up on the mountain, and there's a little discrepancy on, you know, which mountain it was, and we'll get into that in a, in a little bit, <clears throat> but uh, why did he take... Peter, James, and John. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's true. It's a true statement. Um, I saw one commentator say, you know, could it have also been that they those three were the most likely to get into trouble? And Jesus wanted to keep them close. You know, what were James and John? Sons of thunder. You know, so yeah, it it could have been, it could have been like that. You know, in these incidents. Jesus and his disciples that begin to move south, they're back towards the Sea of Galilee, beginning the long journey to Jerusalem, where the cross and death awaits Jesus. They're starting to come to that, 
that understanding. Then Mark tells us that Jesus was transfigured before his disciples. The Greek word here is uh, metamorphio, which means, you know, we use metamorphosis uh, comes from that. And Jesus underwent this transformation. And suddenly the glory that was hidden and veiled by the cloak of his humanity, verse four, revealing his deity to the disciples. Matthew said in his, in his gospel, that Jesus' face shone like the sun. Both Matthew and Mark use the word transfigured to describe what happened to Jesus. And for a brief time, Jesus took on the appearance of the appropriate king of glory that he is. You know, basically, Jesus' whole appearance shone forth in glory, bright light, his clothes were shining, and it's coming from within. I don't want you to get the impression that, you know, all of a sudden you had, you know, bright light or sun or something else was shining on him. This glory, this whiteness that he's trying to describe is coming from within. And in fact, the word transfigured describes a change from on the outside that comes from within. That's what transfigure really means. And it's also important to note that this is not a new miracle. The miracle was that Jesus was able to hide his glory from them until this moment. Spurgeon says, I love, I love this one. Did I give you this one, Jack? The... Yes. Go ahead and read that. For Christ to be glorious is almost a less matter than for him to restrain or hide his glory. It is forever his glory that he concealed his glory and that though he was rich for our sakes, he became poor. So Spurgeon is saying the real glory, the, the real glory is that he was able to hide his glory all this time. You know, and think about how Jesus slowly uh, revealed, how slowly he is revealed in the book of Mark. I want to go through a couple of these things very, very quickly. I don't know. Well, next one. Um, first, John the Baptist announced him uh, to the public ministry. Uh, God announces that this is his beloved son who he's well pleased. He preaches in the synagogue and immediately people recognize the power of his teachings. They're amazed by his teaching. You know, one who has authority, not like the scribes. He heals many people, casts out demons. He touches and heals a, touches and heals a man with leprosy. And that's in chapter one. He calls the disciples to himself. Uh, he confronts the Pharisees again and again. He teaches them in parables about sowing seeds, farming seeds, mustard seeds. You got a seed, he taught about it. He calms the sea, heals the demon-possessed man of many demons, heals a little girl, heals a woman who had bled for 12 years just by her touching his cloak. He heals by word, by touch, in presence and in absence, raised a child from the dead. He ignored, uh, he's ignored and rejected by his own family. He fed 5,000, later he feeds 4,000, walks on water, starts laying out the plans of what must happen gets confirmation from Peter that you are the Christ, then immediately has to rebuke him, you know, for saying the things that must happen aren't going to happen on his watch. And now he reveals his glory to them in the transfiguration. That's a lot going on here. You know, you think about all the disciples, what they've seen so far, and God, Jesus is slowly revealing who he is. That's a lot to take in. It's a lot to understand. It's a lot to reconcile. I understand, you know, the disciples having a lot of questions, you know, like when he, when he called them to see, who is this guy? You weren't here for that. I had a nice Chicago reference for you, Len, when you were in this service. Who is this guy? You know, and they should be saying, I know a guy, right? I know a guy. It's a lot to reconcile and understand the Messiah. And if that's not enough, Elijah and Moses are there too, Jack. Let's, uh, let's read verses four to eight. And Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter responded and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know how to reply, for they became terrified. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son, Listen to him. 
And suddenly they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. What a great account, isn't it? Can you imagine, can you imagine being party to that and seeing that? Uh, you know, in Luke, it says uh, um, they were talking that Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about his departure. Okay. Mark doesn't say what they're, what, what they're talking about. Okay. But in Luke, it says, uh, Jack, did I give you that verse? Yes, um, yeah. This is 30, Luke yeah. uh, 9, 30 to 32. And behold, two men were talking with him and they were Moses and Elijah who appearing in glory were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who were standing with him. Overcome with sleep? Was, was this a vision they saw? No. It says when they were fully awake. When they were fully awake. What does that mean? Did you fall asleep praying like you did in the garden later? Did they fall like dead men at God's glory being revealed, like John did in Revelation? You know, many wonder why these two in particular from the Old Testament and not others. Why wasn't it Abraham or David or Joseph or Daniel? Len? Uh, one of the commentaries I read indicates that they actually represented the law and the prophets. That's that's right. That's, that's and one the reason. law and the prophets were going to have to step aside to accommodate Jesus. Yeah. Well, that that's certainly one, and that's one I uh, I probably trust in the most. But this also believes that that it represents those who die and go to glory, as in Moses, and Elijah, who represents those who are caught up to heaven without death. So it could be both of those both those things. But I I do think this Moses is representing the law, and Elijah is representing the prophets. Terry. I've also um, heard it suggested that they could be the identity of the two witnesses in the tribulation because those miracles and things that they were doing were the same things. That yeah, was in yeah, I've, I've read that in a number of commentaries as well that they they could be the the, the ones mentioned in in uh, Revelation. The other thing we need to notice is they knew who it was. They knew it was Moses. They knew it was Elijah. What does that tell you? Given divine understanding. Given divine understanding, but also they're recognizable. When we go to heaven, you're going to know people. You're going to recognize people. Not just the prophets and, and uh, the saints that went before us, but you're going to recognize family and loved ones in heaven. That's what I think that is, is telling us. If heaven resembles the church, then they all will have name tags that say, hello, my name is. <laughs> <laughs> Donuts are this way. Coffee is this way. Yeah. And I love Peter. I, I love Peter. His response, he's, he's, he's so in fear, as it's understandable. We've talked about this before. People who come into the presence of God, it's not usually people singing zippity doo -dah, I'm in standing in front of God. No, it is fear and dread is usually the reaction. And Peter can only think, you know, uh, you know, you got some pretty big guys here. We should build some buildings for them. We should build a tabernacle for, for each of you guys. I kind of get it. Okay. When you're that fearful, you, you don't know what to say. What can you say? So Peter being Peter, you know, says that. And it kind of makes sense. He says, this is good. You know, this is how it should be. Forget this business about suffering Jesus. Forget to, about being rejected and crucified. Let's build some tabernacles, you know, and live this way with a glorified Christ. That's what he's really thinking, Alvin. Very interesting, because since they were talking about his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem, you wonder how much of, of the details were being discussed. Yeah, and they were there. Did they get to hear that? We we don't know. It doesn't, doesn't say, but... These things are starting to fall into place for the disciples. They're hearing that conversation. Um, you know, we often, you know, get into trouble when we speak, just like Peter did. Uh, fortunately, that's never been a problem for me. Um, but not knowing to say, Peter's a man of action. Okay, I don't know what to say, and I'm afraid. 
let's build some tabernacles. Jack, read the, you get, him in, you get a big dose of Spurgeon today. Read uh, that quote from Spurgeon, if you don't mind. Peter was open-hearted, bold, enthusiastic. Well, that's that's an understatement of the of the year, isn't it? <laughs> he was bold, open-hearted, and enthusiastic. Yes, he was. I love Peter. Go ahead. To my mind, there is something very lovable about Peter. And in my opinion, we need more Peters in the church of the present day. Though they are rash and impulsive, yet there is fire in them and there is steam in them so that they keep us going. Isn't that great? What a great description. Jack. Talk to elder groups. We encourage them to put one or two people like that on the elder board. Not more than that. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you can fill an elder board full of uh, accountants and engineers and stodgy old Christians <laughs> and you and you never go anywhere, but you got to have a one or two guys on there that push you and are a little crazy. Sons of thunder. Yeah, yes. you do. You you need that. Yeah, I can I can honestly tell you that there were times that I sat in certain meetings in business because I was the Peter of that group, you know, and I got to tell you, it's it's not a bad gig. <laughs> You know, and then it says about the cloud. Um, where is that at again, Jack? Um, overcame the slave of it. Um, what verse was that here? Oh, that voice came out of the cloud. Okay, back in Mark. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And the, the Jewish rabbis had a, a term for this. Now, this isn't a term that's actually found in the Bible, but it's called Shekinah. And Shekinah does, it doesn't, while well, it doesn't appear, the concept clearly does. Um, the Jewish rabbis coined the expression as a form of a Hebrew word that literally means he caused to dwell. That's what the word actually means, signifying that it was a divine visitation of the presence or dwelling of Lord God on this earth. You know, think of all the different places that we see the cloud. It was a pillar of the cloud that stood by Israel in the wilderness, Exodus 13. It was the cloud of glory that God spoke to Israel, Exodus 16. It was the cloud of glory that God met with Moses and others. It was a cloud of glory that stood by the door of the tabernacle. It was this cloud that God appeared to the high priest, the holy place inside the veil. It was from this cloud God appeared to Solomon when the temple was dedicated. It was the cloud of Ezekiel's vision filling the temple of God with the brightness of his glory. It was the cloud of glory that overshadowed Mary when she conceived Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. It was the cloud of glory that received Jesus in heaven at his ascension. It was the cloud that will display the glory of Jesus Christ when he returns in triumph. That's a pretty important cloud, isn't it? Shekinah. This is not a random, <laughs> random cloud. Let's let's move on, Jack. Verses 9 to 13. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. Uh, hang on just a second. We've been going in this book, we've been going back and forth. Some people he is told, hey, don't mention what you saw. And other people he told them, go tell everybody. Okay. Why do you think he's telling them? Don't tell anybody what you saw until after. All that timing. Timing, yeah, timing is 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 a is a big reason there. Probably not. Probably not. But after he raises from the dead, probably got a lot of believers. Yeah. Go ahead, Jack. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does come first, and he restores all things. And yet, how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did, not, and they did to him whatever they wanted, just as it is written of him. How do you think that's making the disciples feel? This whole situation, you're hearing conversations go on. You're now you're asking Jesus, you know, about this stuff. 
Um, he, and he's telling you, don't talk to anybody about this. And then it says, they were discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. So even though Jesus is revealing himself more and more as we get through the book of Mark, they still don't understand these things. Why, why wouldn't they understand what raising from the dead means? Well, Jesus already raised a, a person from the dead earlier. You know, they had to have seen that. I think at that time, they did not really understand that he was talking spiritually. They were still locked into this earthly view of the Messiah and his purpose. They can't, they can't get out of their own way. You've been taught for so many years that they can't get out of their own way to understand what some of those things mean. Yeah, but Peter, you know, talks about this in, in his own letters. Uh, Jack, did I give you a uh, second Peter 1, 16, 18? Yes. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such a declaration as this made, made to him uh, by the mag majestic, majestic glory. Right, yeah. I'm going to read that one again. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such a declaration as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this declaration made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. That's quite a declaration. And they're eyewitnesses to that. You think that, uh, Lynn? John, one of the things you asked earlier is why... Didn't Jesus want them to tell anybody? And, and I think Jesus knew uh, what would happen because if, if you remember the triumphal entry, they were ready to make him king. Oh, yeah. And, and, and Peter, James, and John knew from seeing this that Jesus was the Messiah. Okay, well, if, if they really promoted what they saw uh, among the people, they would have made him king. And I think he didn't want that. He knew yeah. he had to have a different path. That's right. He knew he knew the path. And they're still trying to fit him into the path that they had perceived in their minds. That's exactly. Jack. Uh, well, see, when you read First Peter, First John, and in, in the later books, you can see the maturity level and how much it changed from the early days when they were wide-eyed and gaga over being with Jesus. Oh, like, yeah. The Messiah, the king. Not in the early days. They didn't know if they were going to be part of the part of the ruling class. That's right. Because he, if he was going to be the king, am I going to be like the uh, head dude of the army or am I going to yeah. be in? But when the, at the end, and that's the joy thing you were talking about earlier. That's the, that's the answer. It's maturity in Christ that brings a joy that many believers never reach. And it talks about that in Hebrews. It talks about the maturity. Some of you are still back on the on the childish things yeah, i'm feeding you milk yeah i'm understand. feeding you milk yeah. and and these you can see in their writings later on how much how mature they became after the resurrection yeah that, that's really true and you really see it as you go through the the letters later i mean peter when when jesus was going through what did he do he denied him and now he is the boldest you know, at, you know in Acts, you know, he he tells them straight out, you killed the Messiah. You know, that's that's pretty gutsy. You know, he became he became more emboldened as they start to now that it's fully unfolded in Acts, you really get to see how bold Aaron it goes on and on. Now, last week we talked about the gates of Hades. And I, I and Bart and I were talking about this. I wanted to go back just a little bit. This was I the picture I showed you last week. The gates of Hades is right here. Remember, Bart was saying that you know you would make these sacrifices inside there, and this is this is inside that cave. So, this uh, this section right here, this is a close up of it. This is the rock that Bart was talking about last week that you would sacrifice ch children onto, and if their blood seeped through the waterways here, your sacrifice was rejected. It had to be taken in. That's the gates of Hades. And also at the foot of this, these mountains, uh, it was a high pagan uh, area. You had lots of false gods there. Um, we talked about the God of Pan. We talked about 
Baal, you you name it. There's 20 different cults that that camped out, made an area at the foothills of this mountain. The interesting thing, now there's some there's some different um, uh, views on where the transfiguration happened, but at these foothills, this is Mount Hermon. Okay, so that's at the foothills of it. And many people believe, and there's some argument about this, so I'm not going to, as I told Barter, this is not a hill to die on, but it makes sense that that transfiguration, the, the Bible says, heaven on a high mountain, and the highest mountain there is Mount Hermon, and that's the foothills that you're seeing right here. It kind of makes sense that Jesus would transfigure on that mountain as a statement. He's already made the statement about Peter. In the church, the gates of Hades will not prevail against that. And now the transfiguration six days later on the same mountain, that kind of makes sense to me. There's other mountain ranges around there that it could have been. Um, I don't know. Definitively, it doesn't say. The Bible only says the high mountain, Mount Hermon is the highest mountain there. So it kind of goes full circle. You've got the gates of Hades. And then you get the transfiguration six days later on that mount. 